Breakfast is served, but who did the serving made some headlines. And the ball is in the court of the NCAA. Minnesota tries to land a major tournament. Details in Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. A bill that would provide free school breakfast to all Minnesota students did fail in the 2014 legislative session. But all kindergartners will have free breakfast beginning in the fall as a part of a $4 million appropriation that was included in the Education Finance Bill. Governor Mark Dayton joined this group of school officials and lawmakers to serve up breakfast to students at Morris Bay Elementary in Coon Rapids. We service 207 students in the morning for breakfast here at Morris Bay Elementary. We have a grab and go program. The students are able to come through the line and go to their classrooms and have a community breakfast in their classroom with their morning meeting. It's a great opportunity to build relationships for our teachers with the students. As we know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day and it's great next year that we're going to have it for our kindergartners as well as hopefully in the next two years for all of our students across the state of Minnesota. Students come into our building at 915. They get in line, they have a, a paper boat uh, where they have their choices for breakfast and they head to their classroom. And the students know as well as the teachers that this is their time in the morning to eat breakfast and to be able to have a morning meeting where they discuss, they either do a calendar math discussing how, how did your evening go, um, how are you doing, that relationship building piece and how important that is for our teachers and students to be able to have a community of learners and a strong success in student achievement. It's, it's so important and I was reminded of that that I taught in New York City two years after college and my, a lot of my kids came to school with no breakfast and 25 cents in their pocket for french fries for lunch. Back 40 years ago french fries only cost 25 cents. A, carton but uh, the point was that they you know were had a hard time tracking and paying attention because they were malnourished so this is so important and I will totally support with uh, Senator Johnson Representative Newton and Commissioner Caselius who's also championed this I'll totally support uh, full funding for all uh, all elementary school children next year and then we'll move on from there because it really is vitally important. Senator Alice Johnson carried the legislation that would have funded an expanded free breakfast program. My initiative partially got funded because we took care of kindergarten. I requested for uh, gate, uh, grades K through five, uh, but uh, there wasn't enough money available, it seemed like, and so uh, we just went with kindergarten. It was, it's great, it's a great start, and I think the governor made it very clear today in the press conference that he has good intentions and is likely to see us have breakfast for at least all of the elementary schools next year. And you brought up the uh, the junior high level children, middle school level children. How important is it to you to move forward with free breakfast for every student at some point, or, or are you content with elementary? I'm not content with only elementary. My goal uh, has been for the last, well, since 1993, my goal has been to have free breakfast for everyone in this state, uh, in the schools. Uh, because I think it's it's so cheap. It's such a such a low cost for what we get uh, out of it. The kids are going to be in school more. They will they even come to school because the food is there, and they don't want to be just uh, singled out as saying, "Oh, my family has doesn't have very high incomes, therefore we we have to eat breakfast uh, in the cafeteria by ourselves while the other kids are in the classroom." No, we don't want to do that. We want to re erase that stigma. Senator, accessibility is one thing, but getting kids to participate can be another, and getting them to eat what's placed in front of them is another issue. Are there any accountability measures built into this program thus far to make sure that kids are indeed eating what's being presented? Uh, interesting that you mentioned that, because I asked uh, one of the uh, uh, kitchen staff today if what about waste and she said well right now we don't see what the waste is that the the building janitors would probably be the ones that could tell you because the kids are now in their classrooms eating um, but I, I think um, is you it know, something that you think is important to track I, I think it's important but I think they do that if they find out that the kids aren't taking certain products, if they're finding them in the garbage. I think the school staff, the nutrition people, know what 
what is important in it is to get good healthy food into children's bodies. If you have good healthy food and nobody eats it, it doesn't count. So my last question for you then, Senator, it is the interim, but session is what, five, six months away now, six months away? Are you working actively on crafting legislation at this point, or will you wait a while? Will you carry it next year? Oh, I will be definitely. We will have a bill in for probably free breakfast for all, um, because that's where it will, it will start. That will give us the opportunity to talk about the value of it throughout uh, high, high school even, too. Um, but uh, also the federal program that's uh, being put into place. I think working with the federal program that's encouraging uh, breakfast, free breakfast for all schools, especially if they have a high population of low-income people. Um, I think with that, it'll, we'll find enough money to do it. She helped serve breakfast to students in Coon Rapids on Wednesday morning. On Wednesday afternoon, she decided to come in here to the Capitol Report set and talk a little bit about the legislature and how it affects education. Thank you for joining us, Commissioner Casilius. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Julie. Glad to be here. Let's begin with the funding, the funding of the program to provide breakfast for kindergarten students. The pledge was made at the event on Wednesday to try to expand the program to all elementary students, preferably next year. So where does this fall on your priority list? It's absolutely a priority to having a world-class education system to make sure that kids have healthy nutrition, that they have healthy tummies and healthy minds. And so this is a top priority for us. It was with the school lunch, and breakfast just comes with it because the research is really clear that if kids have a good breakfast, they get a great start to their day and, and they learn better. Okay, and we've talked quite a bit about that event, so let's move on to the work of the legislature in its entirety. You can't really just pinpoint 2014 without incorporating what happened in 2013 mm -hmm. as far as education is concerned. We have increases to the education funding levels, early childhood education, all-day kindergarten. These are just some of the highlights. So let's begin. Do you think the funding level is where it needs to be? Well, it was a it's really hard to catch up from 10 years of budget cuts in schools and so always um, doing and trying to get to a better funding formula for our schools as well as more money but we want to make smart investments and so even with 13 and 14 Governor Dayton in a five billion dollar deficit demanded more money for education back in 2011 and so we've been building every year more money. He often says, no excuses, no exceptions. There's going to be more money every year he's governor for education that he's going to put in either in higher ed side or K-12 side. And he's delivered on that promise. And so we're really, um, we're really glad that we've gotten uh, where we are now. We do need to do more. Uh, specifically, uh, we are not meeting all the needs of the students yet in early childhood. Um, we also were able to fund all day kindergarten, which is good. Um, but we have more to do in terms of closing the achievement gap and really targeting dollars toward those efforts to make sure that all kids are getting the services they need in schools. And is there an area that you think there's still a considerable gap when it comes to trying to close the achievement gap? Well, I think pre-K, that's our biggest uh, lever right now, is ensuring that kids get that great first start. We're not playing catch up. That's, the, that's just our biggest thing. And we have 5,500 kids on the waiting list and Head Start. In our scholarship program, we have about 30,000 students who could still use more. In our CCAP funding through the DHS budget, we have about 7,500 kids on the waiting list. So that's a lot of kids still waiting for high quality pre-K and not getting that great first start that other kids have. Okay. So we think that's going to be a huge gap closer for us. Okay, and we'll talk about, um, you know, next session in yeah. just a moment, but I do want to ask you about the Safe and Supportive Schools Act, also known as the Anti-Bully Bill. You know, it was passed, as everybody knows, so how active is the Department of Education in helping districts craft these policies and procedures? Are you pretty hands-on or are you letting, or are districts doing this on their own? Well, Minnesota is a local control state, and there's been a, a strong policy through the Minnesota School Boards Association for bullying. So a lot of our school districts already had bully policies and have been doing like positive behavior uh, intervention and support systems in their schools. Um, but we think that this takes it to the next level of really protecting kids and ensuring that they have safe and welcoming schools. Um, and there's some more accountability uh, to those policies. So we think um, with our climate center, we're going to be able to really help them develop those policies and then really look at the data and ensure that our kids are actually um, safe and, and feeling welcomed and, and feeling comfortable so that they can learn best. Commissioner, let's talk a few about a few other policy changes. 
We have teacher evaluation changes and we're moving away from graduation tests to uh, various assessments. These are a couple of changes that are blasted by, or were blasted by many members of the GOP. So what is your early assessment? Understanding it is early. What's your assessment yeah. of these changes? Well, I think that the teacher evaluation law is good. We've taken our time to really develop it in collaboration with teachers, with principals, because really a principal's job changes quite a bit because they're the ones responsible for doing the evaluations and working alongside peer mentors and making sure teachers have the right kind of support. So we think we've built a really strong teacher evaluation system and we've done it in collaboration with our union. Very little rancor around our teacher evaluation system. The only thing is, is it needs to be funded appropriately. And I've heard the governor and the legislature talk about interest in doing that. We may have steps toward that this session with the additional $10 million to kind of get them started. We have QComp, so we want to be sure that we are able to align our pay for performance program that has evaluation as part of it, make sure that lines up really nice with our new evaluation uh, system and move that forward. As for the assessments, um, and we have our exit exams, um, we no longer are requiring those, but we are requiring a very rigorous test, the ACT, which is accepted by all of our Minsky systems, the University of Minnesota, it's accepted nationally, and so we know that this is a really high bar for our kids to meet, and we've never before required every single kid to take an entrance exam. What are you hearing from school districts concerning these policy changes? Well, I haven't heard any fuss about it, so that's good. And I think they're glad that the ACT is actually going to be paid for by the state. It's a real equity measure, you know, that some kids can afford to take the ACT, which is a barrier for some kids to be able to get admitted into college. Now every kid will be accepted, um, not accepted, but ed, um, expected to take the ACT test. So, Commissioner, do you think that Minnesota students are better off now than they were, say, two, three years ago? I really do. I really do, especially our youngest ones getting that great first start. And then our kids who are now in, uh, are in our public schools who have, you know, had the disadvantage of several cuts and um, some over-testing that has happened. Um, you know, we're trying to right that and, and get them the kind of support that they need, you know, so that they can do better as well. And, and taking off of that, partnering with that phrase, I hate to even say this out loud, but the legislative session begins again in about six months. Yeah, so and it's a funding session. It is a funding session, so are you, you, you must be actively working to craft your next priority list. What are you going to look at? What are some areas you'd like to target? Well, the governor really crafted this seven-point plan in 2011, and that was really a smart policy to make Minnesota schools better, and I heard him say in his speech this, this past weekend, he wants them to be the best. And so they're close to being best in the nation. We saw our fourth grade uh, math scores be number one in the nation now on the nation's report card called the National Assessment for Education Progress. We also saw our reading scores in fourth grade move from 22nd to 10th. So Minnesota kids are better and we are showing progress, but we need to even do better for all our kids. Those stubborn achievement gaps are areas that we need to work on. So with our world's best workforce legislation, I see us being able to work through that. Uh, that was passed in 2013 to really get school districts to align their strategic plans and align QComp teacher evaluation, align their school improvement plans, align their data and assessment systems, and make sure that their resources are targeted specifically with the kids that need them most and that they're creating opportunity for all kids in their schools. Um, so that's part of resourcing adequately, but it's also part of really doing smart planning. So Commissioner, to that point you did mention earlier, it is a funding year coming up in 2015. So do you anticipate seeking a broad increase in the per pupil funding formula? Or if resources are limited for some reason, would you prefer specific targeted areas for any funding increases? Well, we've always supported our seven-point plan, which has some targeted areas and smart investments that we really believe in, high-quality teachers with teacher evaluation, early learning, and making sure that we're uh, doing that. Of course, we want to expand our breakfast and lunch programs as well. Mental health grants has been a real positive thing that we've been working on, uh, expanding out into our schools and making sure that kids have the right support services. And then every year, the governor has said, no exceptions, no excuses. We want to be able to add more money to the per pupil. And so kind of this diverse portfolio of better funding, making sure that uh, we have high quality teachers, making sure that we're investing earlier and our third grade literacy. So it's really just going back to our original plan, being smart about it, about um, resourcing our schools adequately and making sure that they have what they need to be able to address those really tough gaps that okay. we need to address. With those words, Education Commissioner Brenda Casilius, thank you for your time. Always appreciated. Thank you so much. 
For years, they've been known as Asian carp, but the DNR is now educating Minnesotans that the name has changed. We, uh, we not allow the official use of Asian carp, a terminology hurtful to valued members of our communities and as an official language of state government to describe harmful invasive carp. We may not be able to stop others from using the terminology, but we have the opportunity to stop it here in our state agencies. My constituents, most of them, appreciate the amendment and uh, this will serve for the betterment of our state Minnesota in regarding to sensitivity and inclusiveness. Thank you very much. Did you know that you can pull up information on any Minnesota lake using your smartphone or your tablet? And did you know you could also make a camping reservation using your device? We caught up with the Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources, Tom Landwehr, to talk about this new change in technology and many more issues concerning the DNR. Commissioner, I want to begin with something that actually was not a legislative action per se. The governor is touting it as kind of a, an unsession activity. And that's the DNR becoming a bit more to you, for lack of a better phrase, user friendly. A lot of different options of mobile apps right. are available now through the DNR. What kind of information can Minnesotans obtain from their phone? Well, it, it's really fun stuff. I mean, the governor has made it a point of his whole term that we're going to be more uh, available to the public, you know, better government, that kind of a thing. And, and uh, we know that a lot of Minnesotans use the services, uh, use the, the uh, assets we manage. So we're really trying to, you know, stay ahead of the curve a little bit or stay with the curve anyways in terms of technology, but also get information out there in a user-friendly way. So most recently what we, uh, what we rolled out was what we call Fish Minnesota, Fish MN doc, uh, uh, or, uh, MNDNR dot gov backslash fish mn and we'll make sure we provide those websites to yeah, people yeah. as well and it's uh you really you know if you are an angler in minnesota you know that we have a little booklet of fishing regulations and when i say little it's kind of like this kind of little it's it's small in format but it's many many pages because as we've uh, managed our fish populations we've gone more and more to individual lake management plans so if you fish any particular lake the restrictions there might be different than they are on, on another lake and in addition we've got invasive species things people need to be aware about and there's just a lot of information available about different lakes so we have now it's a mobile app it's actually a web-based app but it really comes up nicely on a smartphone for instance and you uh, click on it and identify the lake you want information on up comes really all the information or a lot of information that, that uh, people might find useful so for instance a map comes up, a depth map that shows the contours of the lake, it shows where the public access is on the lake, it'll talk about what species that are in there, it'll tell you what the latest trapping results were on uh, the fish, uh, fish surveys, it'll tell you what's stocked in there, and in addition it'll tell you invasive species and it'll tell you any special regulation. So all on your s smartphone, if all you ever fish is one lake, you just click on it and, and all the information is right there. And as a person who has dropped her cell phone in a lake, it's probably a good idea to utilize this app before you get in the water? Well, you can use it at home and you can use it on the lake. Now, you know, I, I'm in that club as well. Uh, you know, it's amazing how an ice fishing hole eight inches in diameter seems to be the center of the universe when anything hits the ice. But, but so that, that's a good example. You can reserve, a, make a park reservation on your smartphone now. You can make a, uh, you can purchase a license. We've combined a lot of our purchase type activities under what we call Shop DNR now on, on the website, so you can get that. And most recently we rolled out a Minnesota permitting and uh, reporting system for people who have wells that they have to uh, monitor uh, and report back to DNR or if people are going to uh, engage in some wetland activity where they need a permit from DNR. So just a whole bunch of information available now uh, readily on uh, smartphones and on the computer. Okay, Commissioner, let's transition now into some of the work from the legislature or of the legislature. You brought up invasive species. Right. Good place to start. There's $4 million allocated for research at the U of M. What are some of the key concerns with invasive species? Are they the same or do you find that some there are some growing trends? Uh, you know, it's, it's a constant mix because you know most recently Congress acted to close the Upper St. Anthony Falls uh, lock and dam. Now that that helps us immensely with 
something like invasive carp. So there's four invasive carp species. The silver carp is the one that you see jumping in the movies uh, and video clips and so on. Um, the closing of that lock within a year will prevent the spread of that species up into the Brainerd Lakes area. So that is kind of one front, if you will, on invasive species. But I think one of the things that's most concerning to Minnesotans is zebra mussels. You know, there's a lot of vegetative invasive species like water milfoil, but zebra mussels are one that really has caught people's attention. And that's one that uh, most of the spread is done by people either moving a boat or moving some kind of uh, water equipment like a dock or moving minnow buckets and, and so on. And so um, we have a large program, as you know, to ed educate people about that so that people don't inadvertently move invasive species. But our long-term best strategy has got to be investing in the research that identifies solutions that will actually kill or control uh, zebra mussels, and that's what that uh, money is for. It's for the uh, University of Minnesota's Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. Okay, Commissioner, let's talk about the $63 million for various projects from fixing up state parks to acquiring land for new trails. The DNR says it has about $2 billion in needs, however, so what can this $63 million do? How can this start that process? Well, let's go back to the $2 billion. The $2 billion is really a number that uh, is a rough estimate of our uh, total value of uh, fixed assets. So if you think of the park buildings, if you think of the trails, and the, we have 3,000 miles of road that we manage on state forests and a number of bridges, and, and in addition we have 2,800 buildings, some of which are office buildings. So we have a $2 billion inventory of human created assets. Now, you know, in a business or in any kind of home management, you would figure that you need to set aside 1 to 5% of that value per year just to do, in order to do maintenance, you know, put paint on the walls, you know, re roof and, and that kind of a thing. So we calculate that we should have between 20 and 30 million dollars per year just to keep those assets functional. Otherwise, they're just in a long term state of decay. Uh, so we put in a uh, request to the governor's office. What we ended up with was substantially less than what we were hoping for for what we call asset preservation, that taking care of our buildings. So we got 10 million essentially for asset preservation, and that will go to you know sanitation buildings on state parks, maintenance of uh, uh, trails and uh, paved trails and bridges, uh, some of our office upkeep and so on. But as you mentioned, we got 18 million dollars for new state trails. You know we're, we're, we have this desire to build new state trails while we're kind of forgetting to maintain our old state trails. Uh, but there's a number of really important uh, state trail links that we'll do with that. Uh, we've got some flood damage reduction money to help up, especially in Red River Valley, deal with those long-term flooding problems. And so uh, it's, it's a large package that has a lot of different things in it. There's a little bit of money for reforestation in those areas where we had the wind blow down and so on. But uh, it really is taking care of the state's assets, those things that belong to all the citizens of Minnesota. Before we discuss what you're going to look for next legislative session, I want to talk about um, something that I found. The DNR will administer a $2 million grant program for shooting sports facilities because trap shooting apparently is the fastest growing high school sport, according to the Minnesota State High School League. Right. This is a very unique partnership. I would never have thought the DNR and the high school association would, or high school league would be partnering. So talk a little bit about this. Well, the Minnesota State High School Clay Target League is, uh, is, as you mentioned, just a tremendously growing uh, activity. They started about 2009 with some 60 students in six schools. Uh, this year, 6,000 students in 275 schools. This weekend in Alexandria, they'll actually have the championship. They're going to have 4,000 high school students participating in this uh, championship. So it is just really growing uh, very, very quick. Obviously, they need a place to shoot, right? And it's, it's shotguns, it's clay targets. Um, and what we find is that um, the, in general, the, the folks that provide those ranges, it's mostly clubs and so on, over time they've been seeing a loss of uh, members and a reduction in their, uh, the quality of their facilities. And so with this growth, we're trying to encourage that uh, participation in a safe manner by uh, helping the clubs out with some of that. One of the things people may not realize is that uh, the department gets a substantial amount of money from the federal government that is a return of excise taxes on uh, hunting and fishing equipment. So uh, on hunting equipment, it's called the Pittman-Robertson Fund, 11% tax is applied to all hunting equipment, and the state gets that back. And that's used for things like conservation as well as shooting sports. So we have a federal funding source that's going to provide that $2 million. Okay, Commissioner, we are out of time, so I'm going to save my questions on the 2015 legislative session until your next appearance. So thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. I'd be glad to be back.
first the Super Bowl, next the NCAA Final Four Tournament. That's the hope of this group who announced they are shooting for the tournament to come to Minneapolis. I've gotten to experience, uh, you know, a lot of years firsthand just uh, what a great uh, sports community we have here and great fan support and um, I think just uh, a Final Four here would just be uh, tremendous for our, our community and for our state. And someone might ask, why Minneapolis? I'm going to say, why not? When you look at what we have to offer as a city, I think we're second to none. And we talk about having a major university that sits in the heart of the city. I don't think any other city can compare to that. So I think our time is now. I think we have a unique opportunity, you know, to put on a special event. And I think at the end of the day, the NCAA would be happy that they chose Minneapolis for 2019. Really, it starts with the stadium. We would not be submitting this application if we didn't have this brand new, state-of-the-art, one-of-a-kind facility. We've been tracking the restoration project at the Capitol closely and providing you glimpses into what goes into the massive project. Today, we feature a component that affects almost anyone who works here and many who visit the changes to parking. As construction zones become a more prominent part of state capital sight lines, activity levels in and around the Capitol ramp up. Workers continue demolition and repair work while Capitol employees box up their belongings, preparing for relocation to alternative office space. Relocation isn't limited to the Capitol interior, however. Outside, restoration planners determined that vehicles in the parking lots in front of and next to the building had to be moved. Safety concerns and logistical needs required relocation of those parking stalls. Part of the entire Capitol re repair and restoration work is actually shifting a lot of pieces together and moving them around. and. Uh, what's going to happen around the Capitol is it's going to become a construction site, so a lot of the parking that was and uh, very close to the Capitol has to be moved away from the front of the building. And that was one reason they needed to allocate or find space close to the building to uh, accommodate parking for staff. As with the rearranging of interior office space, the displacement of parking spots outside had to be accounted for in other areas. Planners designated the removal of two segments of the Capitol lawn to make those accommodations. The construction of two temporary lots provide the necessary parking space. The lots you'll see in the, the lower and the upper mall, it's just basically temporary spaces. They will be uh, brought back to grass once the uh, project is completed in 2017. So it's just a, once again a remedy for finding places for people to park in close proximity to where they're working. Upon completion of the Capitol Restoration Project, new parking areas will be provided. The temporary lots on the lawn will vanish, and the beautiful surroundings that make up the Capitol's front yard will again be complete. If you're interested in where you can park at the Capitol during the Restoration Project, go to www.mn.gov admin. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. That concludes this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Bartke. Thank you for watching.